Good morning, and thank you for joining us here on the public square for the release of uh, Metro's domestic violence safety assessment. Uh, I want to take a moment to recognize uh, Walter Hunt, who's here from the Metro Council. Standing up here with me today are District Attorney General Tory Johnson, Police Chief Steve Anderson, Pat Shea, the Executive Director of the YWCA, and you'll hear from each of these leaders in just a moment. Also standing with me are judges from the General Sessions uh, Criminal Courts and Circuit Courts, uh, Judge Gail Robinson, Judge Dalton, Judge Holt, Judge Binkley, Judge Smith, and Judge Philip Robinson, along with Sheriff Darren Hall, Criminal Court Clerk Howard Gentry, Circuit Court Clerk Ricky Rooker, Dwayne Phillips, who's the Director of Metro's Emergency Communications, our 911 Center, Captain Kay Loki, who's head of the Police Department's Domestic Violence Division, and John Pugh with Morning Star Sanctuary and Valerie Wynn with the Mary Parish Center, who are both nonprofits that, in addition to the YWCA, provide services and shelter for domestic violence victims in Davidson County. All of these leaders from the various agencies and parts of our government that interact with domestic violence victims and offenders have been critically important in supporting the assessment process. This is a process that began when Jean Crow and Judge Philip Smith came to my office about two and a half years ago and asked if Metro could do a domestic violence safety assessment. Um, I want to say a special word of thanks to Jean Crow, who has had an outstanding career as an advocate and a member of our Legal Aid Society. Um, and there is no doubt in my mind that getting this assessment on course was one of Gene's greatest gifts to the city. So thank you, Gene, so much. In Nashville, our various crime rates change from year to year. And thanks to our police chief and district attorney, most of the change in recent years has been major crime, especially homicide rates, going down. Domestic violence, unfortunately, does not follow that same trend, and our domestic violence assault and domestic violence-related homicide rates remain relatively the same year after year. And this bothers me on several levels. It bothers me as a husband and as a father of two daughters and also as a father of a son. It bothers me as a mayor who wants Nashville to be the very best city it can be because for a city to stay on top, it has to be considered a safe city, a city for all of our residents where safety is paramount, especially families, women, and children. I want you to stop and think for a moment about who domestic violence affects. It affects men, it affects women, it affects children, young boys and young girls who will grow up and repeat behaviors they see in their childhood homes. It affects people in poverty, it affects the middle class, it affects people on the high end of the economic spectrum. It can affect anyone, and no one because of education or income is immune. And anyone who is impacted deserves the very best that we can provide to keep them safe and give them a path to life without abuse and fear. And as the report we're releasing today explains, domestic violence is a unique crime. While most repeat criminals will commit similar offenses against different victims, Domestic abuse offenders often commit escalating violent offenses against the same victim. That is why 20 years ago or so, our society began to handle domestic violence cases differently than other crimes. We created specialized domestic violent dockets and de domestic violence units. But like any good organization, any good government or business, when our practices and policies aren't producing the results we want, it's time to re-examine them and see what we can do different and do better. And that is why we decided to do a domestic violence safety assessment. For this assessment, team members posed the following question. How can Metro better respond to the safety and accountability needs of domestic violence victims and their children? This question seems simple enough at first, but ended up being a question that took a tremendous amount of time and effort to answer. Answering that question took the full, open, and enthusiastic cooperation of department heads and other Metro leadership well represented in the group standing with me today. 
At each point in the assessment process, these Metro leaders and their staff could not have been more supportive. Not only did they enthusiastically open their doors and invited the assessment teams inside, some even began to make changes during the course of the assessment. I know Tori and Chief Anderson will share more specifics about this in a minute, but to mention briefly, the District Attorney's Office created a specialized domestic violence unit. One judge began to provide a private space for DAs to meet with victims. The Domestic Violence Division of the Police Department took significant first steps toward the creation of a high-risk assessment team. And the courts, in an effort to reduce delay, began to place a certain number of domestic violence bond docket cases on the jail docket. And I think that amount of enthusiasm and responsiveness is something for us all to be proud of. Answering our city's assessment question also took the generous commitment of staff by the nonprofit and private sector. Organizations involved, in addition to those standing up here today with me, include our Kids Clinic, Legal Aid, Lioness Foundation, You Have the Power, Family and Children's Services, Tennessee Child Advocacy Center, Batters Intervention Program, 50 Forward, Vanderbilt, Win Consulting, North Highland Consulting, and members from the Private Defense Bar. And most importantly, answering our city's assessment question took a team of over 100 community members that collectively volunteered close to 10,000 hours of their time on this project to do their job of finding gaps in victim safety and offender accountabilities these team members were trained by Praxis International on how to follow the national standards for domestic violence safety assessments they were trained by local experts on how to respectfully interview victims of domestic violence. After being trained, they interviewed victims in court and at the shelters. They talked with practitioners about systems and process concerns. They observed night court, the jail dockets, the domestic violence bond dockets. They did police and sheriff ride-alongs and poured over mountains of data, police reports, 911 tapes, and specific case review materials. I don't think anyone can argue the fact that this assessment was done with respect and with integrity, and that respect and integrity shows in each page of the recommendations of the report and the fact that we have so many leaders standing behind it. As you thumb through the pages, you will clearly see the team found quite a few domestic safety and accountability gaps. And I believe the first place to start in this report is with the nine central goals and recommendations outlined in the beginning of the report. Those nine central goals and recommendations are where change will have the biggest impact for victims because this is how we can improve our coordinated community response. At the end of what has been a long and enlightening process, I am convinced that Nashville has the most committed group of individuals working with domestic violent victims and offenders in the country. Individual commitment is not our problem and never has been. Instead, a lot of our issues stem from those committed individuals not having a system in place that allows them to work as a coordinated team. A year from now, I want to be able to say something very different. I want to be able to say that Nashville has not only the most committed individuals addressing domestic violence, but the most committed team working with domestic violence victims and offenders. It will take a lot to get there. It always takes a lot to move from what's a good idea to what is a good reality. Over the last two years, I've noticed that it's been helpful to have someone within Metro, but independent of any department, pulling this type of work together. To date, that has been Diane Lance, a staff person in my office. Clearly now the job has grown and it is, and it is um, the size of this report uh, at this point which outlines what needs to be done. And for this reason I am pleased to announce today that for the first time in Metro we will have a domestic violence coordinator assigned to implement a coordinated community response to domestic violence and oversee the implementation of the recommendations made in this report. A few months ago, my office applied for a grant with the state of Tennessee to fund a domestic violence coordinator position. We were awarded that grant, which will fund the position for the next three years. And I want to acknowledge uh, Bill Scollin, the director of uh, Office of Criminal Justice Programs, who's here, and thank him and the state of Tennessee for their generosity. 
The primary objective of our domestic violence coordinator will be to work towards a central goal highlighted in the recommendation report, having a family justice center model for domestic violence in Nashville, which would include an integrated data collection system, standardized training for Metro employees that work with domestic violence victims, and increased victim services and advocacy at court. With the addition of this person, we will now have two people working out of my office to help our Metro departments accomplish the report's recommendations. It did not take long to figure out who would be the perfect person for this position. She was on the executive committee of the assessment team. She has been an advocate uh, for a court advocate for the YWCA. She has been a victim witness coordinator at the district attorney's office. She has worked for batterers intervention programs. She has worked for the Sheriff's Office, and most recently she has worked for Legal Aid. I'm pleased to announce that starting October 14th, Whitney McFalls will be the first ever Metro Domestic Violence Coordinator. Whitney. Here she is. <laughs> Well, th thank you, Whitney, and you will do a great job. I remember when I was public defender in the early 1990s when Nashville had a lot of collective momentum surrounding domestic, vi domestic violence, protecting victims and treating batterers. A lot of that momentum was driven by Andrea Conti when she was the first, when she was the first lady of Nashville and the founder of You Have the Power. Andrea is here today, and I'd like to acknowledge her as well and say thank you for your ceaseless commitment um, to this important issue. It is upon Andrea's hard work and others' hard work that we are seeing the second phase of Nashville's improved response to domestic violence. It's time to reinvent our collective response as a government and as a community to domestic violence. It's time for this type of change. And now with this report, we're ready for that change. Again, thank you all for, who have been involved in the assessment process. I've been looking forward to the release of this report now. I'm looking forward to the day not far in the future when we can have a system for handling domestic violence cases that sets the bar for other communities and cities. Three key pieces of this effort going forward will be our district attorney's office, our police department, and our nonprofit community. And we're going to hear from each of them. And I'd like to now turn it over to our district attorney, Tori Johnson. Thank you and good morning. I, um, I would like to just take a, a moment uh, to comment on something that the mayor said, uh, just in recognizing Andrea Conti and also recognizing the initial uh, thrust in this city uh, to combat the scourge of domestic violence was when Mayor Bredesen was, was mayor. Uh, and at that time, uh, he, I think, moved the debate uh, uh, to the forefront it, it became public, he put resources behind it, and we've been working with that ever since. But, but uh, some of us, and I'm one of the ones that have been around a long time, we remember all that. But we also remember how with, over time, with budget constraints and so forth, changes were made, uh, resources were redeployed, and while we were still, uh, as always, committed to trying to work and do our best in the area of domestic violence, uh, the focus began to shift, began to get less, uh, less targeted, I guess you'd say. And so I think it's with a great deal of credit goes to this mayor, Mayor Dean, and his leadership in when, when being approached about the need for this, uh, didn't hesitate but committed uh, the resources really of his office, uh, Diane Lance, who was, has worked tirelessly on this, and knowing that she always had the mayor's support because he was interested in finding solutions that would better the plight of domestic violence victims throughout the city. And I think only through the mayor's leadership could you get such a complete and comprehensive and community-wide uh, program and assessment that's been done. Uh, many of us, uh, well, all of us in, that work in it on a daily basis, the district attorney, the police, the, pro, the courts and probation and so forth, it is sometimes very difficult to separate yourself from the pressures and challenges of every day, uh, of dealing with your everyday duties. 
Uh, it sometimes takes this, this kind of outside intervention to say, in addition to all this, we want you to take some time and be involved in an assessment pro project uh, that is really going to take, take the time to look at how, how we do what we do, where we do it well, and how we could improve. Certainly, the mayor, uh, mayor's support uh, quickly, uh, some of it he realized that some of it's personnel, just not having enough people, not having enough boots on the ground to do the job. And he was, uh, uh, to, to that end, provided two new prosecutors to our office. Uh, since March, we have been able to uh, put them uh, full-time in domestic violence, which gives us an 11-person team and gets us back to the staffing we had in 2003. Uh, we now have six assistant district attorneys and five victim witness coordinators uh, who are working full time in the area of domestic violence. Why is that important? Well, for a lot of reasons. One, well, one thing we did was move and make sure everybody, the entire team was together, physically together. Uh, it doesn't sound like a big deal, but it improves communication. Uh, that's, and that is vital when you're dealing with as many cases and with as many issues. The other thing that that staffing did was increase, uh, allowed us to put an emphasis on holding offenders accountable. Now, we do that every day in court, we hope. But at the same time, there are other things we can do. We can, we can be more consistent about revoking bonds when necessary, uh, pushing for probation revocations when people violate the terms and conditions. Sometimes agreements are, are, are entered into where prosecution is deferred for one way or another if the, the offender will do certain things. But if they don't do those, we need to be able to reactivate those cases. Those are things that are time, uh, they're time sensitive, but they require a lot of commitment and a lot of resources. With the addition of these two prosecutors, we are now able to do that. Uh, we are able to staff serious cases with the Metropolitan Police Department's Domestic Violence Unit, again, to bring the best minds together. Our victim witness coordinators, who are, who are so dedicated, uh, are making it their goal to try to contact victims of domestic violence within 48 hours, uh, to make that first contact into what is going to be a confusing, uh, uh, sometimes, often, confusing entree into the criminal justice system. And on top of all that, we have tried to do additional community outreach uh, by sponsoring and raising money for an apartment with the Mary Parish Center, pencil partners with McGavick High School, and educating middle, middle school girls on domestic violence warning signs. It's a community effort. We appreciate it. We appreciate what the community has done. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, in improving our efforts in the area of domestic violence and working in conjunction with all the many people behind me and well and in front of me uh, to continue to make Nashville's response the best it possibly can be. And one of the key figures in that is our excellent chief of police, uh, someone who I've worked with uh, all my career. Uh, as, as I've been in the di district attorney's office, he's been in the police department. Uh, I have the utmost respect for him and Nashville's fortunate to have him, Chief Steve Anderson. Thank you, General Johnson, for that kind introduction, and good morning to everyone here. It's clear from this gathering of concerned citizens, some standing behind, some out here, that Nashville is actively working on a number of innovative ways to achieve a real reduction in domestic violence. The recommendations contained in this morning's report, I believe, will assist in our goal to enhance protections for women and children while at the same time holding offenders accountable for their conduct. And I think it's good to pause again at this moment and realize that there were more than 100 people that volunteered their time to create this report. So thank you to each and every one of them that gave up their personal life to do this. These are persons that determine to make Nashville this safer place for our women and our children. Certainly, I want to talk about the Metropolitan Police Department Domestic Violence Division and highlight their dedicated work under the direction of Captain Kay Loki. Reporting to Kay Loki, there are 17 domestic violence detectives, four sergeants, four counselors, and three professional uh, support staff. 
I'm very proud of that division, and I'm proud to say that they are very caring men and women, each of them who have asked to be assigned to that division. Under Captain Loki's leadership, we recently formed a risk and lethality intervention team. When a detective receives three reports, naming either the victim or the perpetrator within a 12-month period, those histories are reviewed to determine whether this relationship should be addressed by an intervention panel. This panel consists of representatives from the District Attorney's Office, State Pardons and Parole, Metro Probation, Legal Aid Society, the YWCA, and a counselor from the Police Department Domestic Violence Division. When an inter intervention plan is developed and put into place, there is follow-up with a appropriate resources. Over the past months, 29 individuals have been presented to this panel. Another initiative Captain Loki will soon have in place deals with orders of protection. We are developing computer software to provide patrol officers, officers out there in the field patrolling our neighborhoods, information on persons that live in their zone, victims that live in their zone, that are subject to orders of protection. And these patrol officers will drop by to conduct welfare checks, just to check in to see how is it going and document any information that might need to be passed along to the detectives. We'll also be checking on respondents. Now respondents are the persons who, to whom the order of protection is directed against. We'll be doing this just as a reminder that the order of protection remains into place and that, that we're monitoring their conduct. And during those visits, they'll receive a letter pointing out that the Domestic Violence Division is monitoring their every move. I need to tell you why this is important. In 2012, 60% of the 1,300 aggravated assault reports received by the Domestic Violence Division involved repeat offenders. This is yet another step in breaking that cycle of violence. Captain Loki is doing an excellent job of moving the initiatives of the Domestic Violence Division forward, but I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about some other people have, that have served in that capacity. Captain Rita Baker, Captain Dahana Jones, and Commander Michelle Donegan, who I think is in another meeting at this time. But those three individuals that served before Captain Loki uh, have taken their work and taken it to their new assignments and they sort of remain my advisory team about what needs to be done in the way of moving our domestic violence division forward so and each one has built on the success of the past so thank you to each of you you know it was announced last week that the police department will be partnering with the martha o'brien center they're receiving a one million dollar grant to address domestic violence issues in the James Casey projects. This program will be known as the Force for Good project. Our officers under the leadership of Commander Imhoff at the East, East Precinct will be working with the Martha O'Brien staff to promote the building of positive family and peer relationship throughout the James Casey neighborhoods. Sustaining these relationships and breaking this silence of, of violence is the key to letting our children know that we care and keeping in them on the path from following that, that pattern of violence. Domestic violence represents nearly 40% of all the aggravated assaults and 60% of, of all the simple assaults that occurred in James Casey over the past year. And this morning's report the report we just received, and the Force for Good project in the James Casey homes comes at a time that the YWCA is introducing a program entitled Engaging Men to Stop Violence Against Women and Girls. Let me repeat that. Engaging Men to Stop Violence Against Women and Girls. They'll be implementing that program throughout all of Nashville. I'm pleased to be on the advisory board for the YWCA. And the police department is proud to partner with YWCA President Pat Shea in working to make a real difference for the safety of Nashville, especially its women and children. 
Now, I don't want to steal Pat's thunder, but she is bringing to Nashville a gentleman named Tony Porter. I want you to listen very carefully to that name. I'm hoping that it will be a household, world, a household word in the years to come. But Tony has an important message that all of Nashville needs to hear. Pat, thank you for all you do. Would you please come forward? This is a great day in Nashville, Tennessee. Thank you so much, Mayor Dean, District Attorney General Johnson, and Chief Anderson. I'd also like to recognize and thank the amazing leaders who worked tirelessly on this assessment, including several of my staff and some really great board members. I'm truly honored to be speaking today on behalf of the not-for-profits who were involved in this project. And I want to specifically recognize our friends and partners who are behind me, um, the CEO of Morningstar and the CEO of Mary Parish. Valerie and John have been partners with the YWCA working on domestic violence for years, and their work is work that all of us benefit from every day and every night when we go to sleep. None of us would be here today if it weren't for the visionary leader that we have in Mayor Carl Dean. You see, as President Harry Truman once said, men make history, not the other way around. In periods where there's no leadership, society stands still. Progress occurs when courageous, skillful leaders seize opportunities to change things for the better. Mayor Dean recognizes that domestic violence is a crisis in our community. Mayor Dean is courageous courageous for taking on this effort and allowing us to all benefit from the leadership of Diane Lance. And I believe, thanks to this safety assessment, things will change for the better. The assessment has shined the light on gaps in our community, opportunities for improvement. By closing these gaps in our system, women and children will be safer, and women and children will live. As you know, the YW runs one of the largest domestic violence programs in the state of Tennessee, which includes a 51-bed shelter. That shelter is full every night. We see women from Bellevue to Bordeaux to Belmede, from Mount Juliet to Madison. Last year, 350 women and children stayed with us for an excess of 16,000 nights. We also answered over 4,000 calls for information and emergency assistance. The YWCA is committed to all that we can do to support these recommendations and close these gaps in our community. And using this report, the YW will also, with the knowledge we've gained over the past 40 years, look to close our own gaps and make our own improvements so that we are the stewards that you need us to be in the community. It's something all nonprofits have to do to stay relevant. And as Chief Anderson mentioned, we've looked at what we've been providing, and I feel proud of the services we provided for over 40 years to women and children, and we will continue to provide those services. But we have recognized a weakness, and we are aggressively and welcoming asking men to step up and join us to reduce violence against women and girls in this community. And although most men are not violent, it is men who commit the vast majority of violence against women. But we have faith. We believe that when the good guys, our husbands, our fathers, our brothers, our friends, understand the depth and size of this problem, of this violence against women and girls in the community, they will want to help. They will step up, and we need them. We want Nashville to be the safest city in the country for women and girls, and the Domestic Violence Safety Assessment is the roadmap for us getting there. It gives us all concrete, actionable things that we can work on. Thank you, Mayor Dean. I truly believe, as President Truman said, you have seized the opportunity to change things for the better.
Well, thank you, Pat, and thank you all for coming. Um, please get a report, and you know we're on the right track because it didn't rain. Um, and the speakers will be available for questions from the media. Thank you.